sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so just a couple of words about this. Um, as they said, my name is Mark Sullivan, and I'm a music composer and a photographer, and I also work with Science Gallery. And part of the idea for this particular intersection came out of a series of discussions that I had the good fortune to have with each of these people here over a period of about a year and a half. And another discussion that Troy Livingston and I had with Hendrik uh, not too long ago. And the idea of this is really, I mean, people keep calling us a panel, but we really don't want to be a panel in the traditional sense. We want to have a dialogue between us, and we want to open it up to you all about halfway through. So part of what we're trying to do is sort of recreate dialogues that we already had, but we're also taking the risk. And no, I won't ask you about the physics of sight. Don't worry. <laughs> but we want to actually have a real dialogue. And to, to sort of give you a taste of how scientists and artists could talk to one another and explore how to talk to one another to find out what might, be, what might make it worthwhile to talk to one another and to connect art and science. And we're not just talking about art with a capital A, like museum art and art in art schools. We're talking about anything that has to do with sort of creative activity that leads to production. And we're also not talking just about big science, even though they're all involved in a premier science institution. We're also talking about scientific thinking in general. Like, how can people find out about things that they can't see and touch directly? And how can they rely on what they're finding out uh, if they do that a particular way as opposed to another way? So in a way, this dialogue is also about scientific thought. And it's also about the relationship between a knowledgeable, literate, democratic public and scientific and artistic endeavors. So that's the frame that I would put on this. and. Uh, We'll probably take half an hour. We've got a couple, couple of music pieces to play, and you're all welcome to look at the art, which has come out of some of these dialogues about physics. We'll have some other opportunities to do this in the future. But uh, uh, roughly halfway through, we're going to open it up and to your comments, your questions, or observations, and we'll see where it goes. So um, to start things off, we actually would like to show a video. This is the Neutron Star video. We opted to tell the people in the booth what we want to do from here instead of doing it all automatically. So we'll see if this works. So this is a, I wrote the music for this, and the uh, video itself is a computer simulation that took about two and a half months to create using three or four supercomputers. I believe, if I remember correctly, it was done by the Salk Institute for Nuclear Astrophysics. And uh, they own the copyright, not me. So um, I figured out how to make the music by watching the video and talking primarily to Henrik about this. And he'll have some things to say about what, what he said that got me interested in this. But for the moment, we just want to show the video. It's about two minutes. <laughs>
Okay. So that gives you an idea. And a few things about me, just to sort of start this off, because it's really important to me that you understand I'm, I'm not an expert in physics. And I was not an expert when I came to Hendrick. I was anything but. I had basically a, a, a layperson's understanding and not a very good one. And so like, part of this was me finding out that stars were not just little points of light in the sky like Christmas tree lights, which is what I thought. And uh, I never even, it was, I couldn't imagine that somebody sits around eight hours a day thinking about stars. And then I remembered a question somebody asked me once, which was like, well, don't you sit around eight hours a day and think about things that vibrate at different speeds and the structure that makes? And I thought, well, you know, it's not so much different thinking about music and thinking about stars. Like, they're both kind of unusual things to talk about. But really, the impetus to create the music for this film came from what he told me about neutron stars. So what I'd like to do now is pass this off and let him sort of uh, recreate some of that. Maybe not exactly, but in a way, tell you. And if you already know what a neutron star is and, and the process, fine. But if not, I think he'll introduce you to it. Yeah, um, so what, what you saw, uh, uh, I don't know if you recognize it, uh, is a dying star, and the stars die at the end of their lives, and, and they form this incredibly dense object. I don't know if you saw this, this little light blue ball in the middle that sometimes shone through. That, that's the neutron star. And um, that triggers actually then the explosion uh, that ejects um, all the star's material into space, and that's actually where, um, that, that one of the questions I'm interested in is the origin of the elements, where, where does all the elements in this room, where do they come from? And it's actually from those exploding stars. Uh, so everything in this room uh, eventually was made in, in that kind of environment. And including us, uh, the carbon oxygen in our bodies, uh, that's where it comes from. And um, uh, I, I work at, the AFRIB accelerator uh, at, uh, at MSU to, to sort of uh, study some of the process in the laboratory, some of the nuclear reactions that happen. Um, so, um, yeah, but I mean, one of the fascinating concepts in that is, is that neutron star object. It's the densest object in the universe. And um, I remember when Mark walked into my office the first time, um, he said, I'm, I'm an artist and I want to know about neutron stars. And, I was very puzzled. We're not used to <laughs> see artists, um, but and so I told him, um, "Yeah, I'm I'm working on neutron stars." And he asked, "Well, what is that?" And uh, these incredibly dense objects. And I saw his lights, uh, his eyes lighting up, and and I, I figured he he wanted to somehow put this concept of this extreme density into into music, and um, that got me interested because we have these crazy concepts. <laughs> And there's really no good way to explain it and to, to help people experience it. And that's maybe something where art can come in. And, and so I, uh, I try to explain, um, uh, I want to explain this to, to, to yeah, this, uh, it's, the size is about uh, a few miles. And it, uh, uh, it has the same mass as the sun. So imagine the entire sun gets compressed into a little ball of a few miles uh, diameter. Um, but that didn't. I don't know, that didn't work so well. <laughs> so um, I, I try to explain, like if you scoop a tablespoon of neutron star matter up, uh, this incredibly dense matter, it's incredibly heavy. And I had to think of something that's incredibly heavy, and the heaviest thing I could think of was an aircraft carrier, right? It's probably the most heaviest thing you can think of that's uh, still part of your everyday experience. <laughs> So imagine 100,000 of those. That's the weight of a tablespoon of this neutron star matter. Um, but I don't know, then he wanted to know, how can I put this in notes? Uh, he, wanted to, uh, so he, he wanted to compress notes to illustrate the density. And yeah, and so I told him, well, if you compress them a million times, then, then you're, uh, well, a billion times, uh, uh, then you're not even there in another million on top of that, uh, that's roughly, uh, that's the density you have to go to. And I saw him struggling with, with that scale. <laughs> and that, I thought this was very interesting uh, because then I realized how crazy that actually is. And um, yeah. So 
that's part of also what we're trying to talk about. Like, there's when he said these, he, he's not joking. Like that, those were my reactions, and I, I'm still thinking about. It. I was thinking about it yesterday. I thought, what a difference between looking up at the sky and thinking it's like a bunch of Christmas tree lights, or looking up and thinking it's like thousands of nuclear explosions in the air. I mean, it's a completely different image, and and also these time scales. Like they're talking about. Incredible, I mean, not only the density, but the speeds, like trillions of a second. And I was like, how can you make music that even touches on anything that's happening in a trillionth of a second? Like, if you blow it up, it's like you're gonna be having people listening for 17 hours so they can get the experience of something that only happens for a second in our time. So to me, those kinds of challenges are really interesting. And at some point in the beginning, I was like, there's no way. There's no way literally to translate the data or the relationships that he's talking about into a framework that we can experience. So that was part of it. And part of the other discussion involved moving to Alex, who has uh, a, another dimension of physics. And, and to me, this was also a thing. I didn't know how many different approaches there were to physics. So I went to talk to subnuclear physicists. Hendrix is doing astrophysics. And by the time I was done, I was like, I got to go home. <laughs> this is like, this is my brain is fried because they're going from one end of, of existence to the other and the subnuclear people are talking about dancing quarks and all these crazy things. So, uh, and then Alex is also involved and maybe I can let him tell you a bit and he has a piece of music that he would like to play and talk about. So you've actually yeah, got let a me, mic. Let me tell you, um, I'm a nuclear theorist and I have the, the sorry. Mic. I'm a, um, <clears throat> I'm a nuclear theorist, and my problem is to turn my ideas into numbers that can be compared to experiment and to also into pictures, because that's how you really understand things. So in a way, I really think of physics as, as an art. And through the process, I've ended up, uh, I'm not a composer, I'm not an artist, but I've figured out that the same tools that I use for nuclear theory mainly computer programming, can be used to generate unique art and music. That's my fun part of it. Uh, it's really hard for me to distinguish these things. So um, on your way out, you can look at the pictures over here, which are just some of the graphics. I, I have developed my own graphics programs. And to test them out, sometimes I say, oh, that looks interesting and they're embedded in my program. So I just make a couple do loops, and all of a sudden something comes out. Most of the time, you, you know, you don't want to look at it again. But every once in a while, something really neat comes out. And I think those are some of the best things that have come out of that. And in the same thing, um, the numbers that I am generate, it's fun sometimes to figure out what do they sound like? Can you, can you, hear, can you hear data? And so the music piece that I'm going to show you, if, uh, first of all, there's a figure. Uh, it's, on the, it's on the slide. Next slide. It's on the slide. Yes. Yeah. Look at that. That's it. Now, <clears throat> I, you can regard that as some kind of art, I think. But I'll tell you what it is. It's a Lanzo's tridiagonal matrix in which I use to generate level densities. All right. <laughs> and we'll give a we'll give a door prize of five hundred dollars yeah. <laughs> to anybody who can say what he just said, <laughs> other and, than him. And it turns out to be something related to some new theory that I've been I've been working on this year. I said, okay, what does this sound like? So obviously there's two tracks here, and you'll hear I mean two tracks, and and you'll hear it three times. The whole thing is about two minutes. The first time it goes through those two pictures from bottom to top linearly. Now actually if you look closely they're on a logarithmic scale. So the second time what I did is that I wrote the music so that it goes logarith logarithmically. That is what I did is every note I speed it up all the time. So by the time you get to the end there's a little some, there's a little surprise actually at the end. And then the third variation I take the same thing and just slide the two tracks I mean back and forth a little bit. So what you need to do is l look at the picture from bottom to top, two tracks, listen to the music and see if you can follow along. Can you play the music?
Okay. All right. So, <laughs> everybody follow the picture. <laughs> so, one of the things that what Alex is talking about, and also Hendrik, that, that strikes me, and that's a, of a matter of intense interest, and actually ties into Science Gallery, too, is like we're interested. And one of the reasons that we found it actually worth continuing to talk to each other about is we're interested in whether you can learn things through sound that you not, might not be able to learn by looking. And, and so we're not only interested in creating powerful works of art that maybe can get at something like that density. Like, you know, basically, the sound can get dense. And I thought, well, what if you play every note that a human person can hear at once? That's going to seem pretty dense. It won't really be as dense as these stars are. But it might suggest something that's like a, a, you know, a, a faint glimmer of what that star is like. It might be able to trigger your imagination in a way that has something to do with it. And the same thing with the speed of these things. Like Part of this is it's not, also, it's not only about making good art. It's also about can sound contribute to the understanding of science, to the understanding of physics in ways that maybe visual methods don't. Everybody relies on monitors and graphs, but we also have ears. And you know, what if there are things that can only be understood through hearing? Like just an example, like how could you possibly take a photograph of somebody's tone of voice? So there are things that we apprehend through listening and through hearing that may only be intelligible in that form and maybe have to be translated back to graphics. And so one of the, the really amazing things that can come out of the kind of dialogues that we're talking about is you can learn about science and you can learn about art. And it can be a real, I mean, people talk about this all the time as sort of a productive hybridization, but there really is something to it. So the other part of this, which I think I can use to, to bring Micah into this, because she's interested in what I'm talking about too, and she actually thinks there's a way that the kind of dialogues we're having and the intersection between art and science can inform education of youth and, and getting people to understand that this science is not just for high-level scientists and you know, celebrity artists, it's for people in the street. We're really interested in getting this out in the community and getting young people, not people who are going to science academies. We're talking about average kids in the street, getting them to think about this stuff, getting them to understand that it's got something to offer them and it's worth, and, that, and even more importantly, they can do it. So let me pass this to Micah and she's also, huh? I can use this one. Okay, sorry, <laughs> I forgot. We have four mics, I've never had them before. <laughs> uh, so my name's Micah. I am a, a nuclear physicist by training, but what I do these days is utterly different. Uh, so my job is outreach and education, basically explaining our research to the public, you guys, right? Um, and also getting kids interested. So I actually run a camp called Art to Science, where we really mesh all kinds of science with all kinds of art uh, as much as we can for about 150 kids, which is a fun week. Um, so some of you may have seen uh, me playing when you came in. Uh, so if you look up over that way, this is one way you could turn a voice into an image, right? So any kind of vibration on this is gonna vibrate my little balloon and move a mirror that bounces a laser around. So this is kind of what I was playing with uh, as you were sitting around. I mean, we make these kids with kit or make these kinds of things with kids, or I was playing a little saxophone that sounds god awful horrible. Um, but you know, the kids really get their hands on it. And so if you want them to understand the science of music, you let them build an instrument so they actually see how changing it changes the sound. Um, these days my research is actually on our outreach program, so I um, survey our kids to see how well our programs are going, but then I use that uh, survey data to do research on why physics lacks diversity. Uh, so in case you didn't know, only about 20% of uh, physics PhDs go to women. There are lots of ideas of what, about why that might be, uh, and so I'm trying to investigate that at the K-12 level through our outreach. Um, do we want to show the next? Yeah. So, so before you hit play on this, um, this was one of my early attempts to explain nuclear science to the general public using sound, thinking that maybe you could hear something that you couldn't get by seeing. Um, so what you're staring at is an ex uh, expanded periodic table. So a periodic table has one little box for every element. Here we have one row for every element. Uh, has anybody heard of carbon-14 dating, or carbon dating? 
Yeah, so carbon-14 is like normal carbon that we think of, but with extra neutrons. And so here, every element can have a whole bunch of different numbers of neutrons, so we have them displayed there. And I took all the properties I could think of, or these different isotopes, these different uh, varieties of element, and assigned a musical property to it. So most of these things, there are 3,000 little boxes there. All the ones that aren't black are radioactive. They decay. Uh, so how they decay is the instrument type. Um, how long the note is held corresponds to the half-life or how long it takes to decay on average. Um, something he mentioned was that scale is a huge problem. So the shortest lived isotopes live for 0 0.2101 seconds. The longest ones are actually, you know, millions of years, billions of years, you could say. And so that's uh, four followed by 17 zeros seconds. That's a lot of time scale that I couldn't put in here. So instead of trying to deal with that, I just put the number of zeros, which is the logarithmic scale. So, you know, minus 21 up to 14. I just went with the number of zeros to kind of scale it. Um, so if our uh, guy up there could just click anywhere in the middle, we're not going to listen to it all because it takes forever. We'll play it for like 20, 30 seconds. <laughs> Now we're at the 10 isotopes. All right, that's good. It kind of sounds like the soundtrack to a bad B movie. Um, so this is what happens when a scientist directly translates data um, without any kind of manipulation. It usually doesn't sound good right off the bat. Uh, but my goal was that people could hear the differences and the, the tones. Um, also, the imbalance between protons and neutrons gives it the pitch. So that's why the pitch kind of changed a little bit as it went. Okay. So um, one of the things, Micah played that for me a summer or so ago. And so I got three other composers to take a stab at it, too. And it turns out that even this was incredibly challenging because you usually don't write music to a chart. I mean, it was sort of like, why don't you turn the dictionary into music? Or, you know, something like that. And I was like, well, it, it doesn't have any story. It's like, what, what am I supposed to do with it? So, but something interesting happened, and, and Alex and I were talking about that coming up here today, too, which is sometimes you're just like, well, let me try this. And you try something, and it doesn't work. And maybe sometimes it, it really doesn't work at all. And you throw it out. But you know something from doing that. And so there is this connection. And um, Troy Livingston sometimes talks about scientists and artists being the noticers of society. And I think you find that also in the method, like the experimental method. Like artists try stuff, and they see what happens. And if it doesn't happen the way they want, they change it. And they try, they try things out to find out what they need to change and how they need to do things so that what they want to happen can happen. And that has a very close relationship to what scientists are doing. Right, Alex? You want to yep. respond to that about the uh, density project that you mentioned this afternoon? Yep. Yeah. I think so. Um, should we play? Um, I had one more piece. Yeah. Uh, and so I just there's a piece called Alex Density. You want no, to play it no, first? That was done. Alex Supernova. Oh, super now there's okay. two things that our lab is related to. Actually, neutron stars. That's a big one. And the other one is supernova. And so many years ago, when I was playing with uh, basically combining different forms of music, I realized that what I ended up with reminded me of what happens with a supernova. What happens is that, is that you have something, you have a big star, and it starts to collapse and form layers of elements very slowly. Gravity turns elements into heavier and heavier until you get to iron. And then all of a sudden, you can't go any further, and it continues to go in, and it sometimes, it it depends on the theory, it depends on the star. Sometimes it just turns into a neutron star, but once in a while it explodes. So I tried to say, okay, I've got this thing with the different layers, and then I have an explosion. What, what can I do with that in the way of 
music, and so maybe you can find that one, um, just to hear what that is. Yeah, this, this is the wrong graphic, but graphic you can get rid of. Should be. Is that your piece? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. It's in the slide deck. Oh, that's it. By the way, this, this is, is a this is a didgeridoo, and that's the dark matter background. We'll have Hendrik tell you about dark matter. There's the reactions. And. This is a piece by Chaminade, which has been stretched a factor of five with a method called the Paul stretch. Sorry, yeah. that's what that's, happens. That's, 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 that's all the energy coming out at the end. So it literally explodes. So we think that's partly where our elements come from. And also neutron star mergers, which is a, which is a thing related to neutron stars. Our elements are formed above iron. So that's the, th that, those are the theories that we work on. So just being conscious of people's time and th I forgot to say, but thanks to everybody for coming, and thanks to MOCAD for hosting us. Thanks to Science Gallery for putting this together.